Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Clivia Sotomayor Torres, uh, and I would like to welcome you to the ICN2 seminar, nano seminar in physics. Um, we have two speakers, and first of all, Alejandro Antidormi would give us an introduction to the topic for uh, a brief introduction to the topic. Alejandro, I think uh, <laughs> there you go. Good afternoon, everyone. Maybe I can screen. I sh I'm, can share my screen then. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, that's perfect. So I can start. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for having me in this uh, nano seminar. It's my, it's my first time in a nano seminar at ICN2, indeed. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot. I'm um, Alejandro Mantidormi, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the theoretical and computational nanoscience group here at ICN. In this very short talk, I would like to discuss one specific aspect about uh, neuromorphic computing, and in, partic in particular, the class of materials that can be used in uh, neuromorphic devices. The attention will be focused mostly on disordered materials, and in particular, amorphous boron nitride and uh, graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide. Uh, this choice is uh, motivated basically by the fact that these materials have already been employed recently in real neuromorphic devices, and not less importantly, because these are two materials that have been uh, known in our group for, uh, for some time now. Uh, but just let to mention to uh, create a frame uh, in where, where to move, I would like only to remind the basic definition, maybe the oldest definition on neuromorphic computing, which dates back to the 90s, which says that neuromorphic computing is basically a new paradigm of computation which tries to take inspiration to take inspiration from the uh, working principles of our brain. Uh, neuromorphic engineering then tries to design and fabricate integrated devices which act like uh, neurons and synapses. Uh, even though the definition of neuromorphic computing has evolved in time and is still under debate, it's clear that neuromorphic computing is an alternative to the classical von Neumann architectures of our computers, which are based on the CMOS technology. And, and neuromorphic computing carries along um, a bunch of very useful advantages, uh, like a very large scale integration, uh, much uh, less power consumption, and it's also able to uh, allow for computation based not only on digital signals, like in our computers do, uh, but also on analog ones, and maybe a mix of the two. The, the main, the, the core device of a neuromorphic circuit, of a neuromorphic architecture, is a memristor, which is a, a two-terminal device uh, with this capability. It can change its conductance, its resistance, depending on the value of the voltage which is uh, applied to its uh, ac across it. Uh, basically, the most basic memory store has two levels of resistance, a high level of resistance and a low level of resistance, and we can switch between the two in a reversible manner. This translates into um, current voltage characteristics, which is characterized by, which is given by high hysteresis, as you can see in the, in the plot. From an experimental, from a practical point of view, there have been already many ways to implement physically a memristor. Some of them are like made by using phase change materials. And in this case, these are materials, very specific materials, which can change their atomistic structure, switching from an amorphous to a crystalline uh, morphology when you apply a voltage to it. And this actually implies a change in the resistance. You can also use networks of nanowires, also organic materials. And in this case, generally, the change in resistance is induced uh, by the, the flow, the motion of charges along the material itself, but also for electric materials. And maybe this is the topic of the next talk. And to the materials. In the slide, in the, in the, the, the largest image of the slide, you can see exactly a, a stack of multi-layer graphene oxide sandwiched between two, uh, two metals. This is a metal insulating metal, insulator metal structure, which is actually the, one of the basic ways to uh, realize a memory store. This indeed has been the way in which last year, in a very nice work, uh, people have been able to demonstrate that graphene oxide that, as I told you, is one of the, the materials that I will be talking about today, 
can be used as a resistive, a resistive switching material. Indeed, when they created basically uh, an interface between platinum, uh, graphene oxide, and copper, and they characterized the current voltage characteristics. They measured the current as a function of the voltage. And this is, as you can see from the panel B of the, the, of the slide, you can, you can recognize quite clearly the hysteresis loop, which is typical of a resistive, resisting switching uh, behavior. Uh, also, the different curves actually overlap uh, that due to different replicas of devices and um, loops re repeated on the same device. You can also see and appreciate the repeatability in, of, the, of the process. Um, the basic physical explanation that, that can be given can be uh, given regarding the change of resistance in graphene oxide uh, relies on the on the migration of the oxygen ions. So oxygen ions from the graphene oxide, when up, when you apply a voltage, move towards the, one of the two electrodes, and this uh, allows to for the change of resistance to take place. This points to a, a very important point, which is trying to understand how the properties of uh, graphene oxide change and are affected by the amount of disorder or oxidizing agents that you have in your material. Uh, you can see in the slide, these are snapshots, these are images taken from our um, simulations, atomistic simulations of graphene oxide, uh, where, where we simulated the thermal annealing process, the thermal reduction process of graphene oxide, with the, starting with an initial different uh, oxygen concentration. Uh, clearly, this is a very complex material, which has always to be compared with the real samples. And so in our case, within our group, a strong collaboration with the Spanish company Avanzar has been exactly useful in this sense, in order to make the our atomistic samples as close as possible to to reality still many questions many uh, many questions are still open regarding transport in uh, graphene oxide and especially in multi-layer graphene oxide in another uh, work which has been published uh, last year some uh, italian collaborators uh, actually performed a very systematic analysis of the transport electron transport properties in graphene oxide multilayers by analyzing how it changes when you change the bit when you tune the different parameters that you have in your in your systems in particular you can see for example starting from the, the plot on the left how the localization localization length which is for non-experts the average distance that an electron can travel in the in the material uh, between be, before getting localized so it gives you an idea of how much conducting the the material is how it actually changes with the amount of crystallinity of your material or we can uh, one can observe exactly the dependence of the localization length with ship size but even more importantly and this is actually the best result of the of the of the work is that the, the authors of the the paper observe that an anomalous transition uh, change in the localization length when the number of layers of graphene oxide exceeds number three, three or four. They basically observe an increase, uh, translated in a different way, they observe an increase of conductance in structure of graphene oxides when many layers are put one on top of the other. In order, in the frame of a collaboration with, uh, in a Flagira project with many other partners from Turkey to, to uh, Belgium and Sweden and, and so on, we actually exploited our computational uh, capabilities to try to give an answer to this uh, conundrum. And indeed, by, by putting together green cubo calculations, land tower calculations in a he, he, enormous effort, we have been able to exactly um, motivate, give an explanation of this process, and computationally uh, explain and retrieve the experimental data. Observe, we observed indeed uh, the increase of the localization length uh, with the number of layers on, on, on graphene oxide. You can observe it in the, in the plot, where the circles correspond to the experimental value, to the measured value, while the crosses correspond exactly to the uh, computed uh, values of localization length in the in the consortium so what, what it means is basically that whenever you have a system made of two contacts and many layers of graphene oxide between the two the presence of many layers of graphene oxide gives a huge increase in the conductance of the system this is exactly um, not in agreement does not correspond to what happens for example to crystalline graphene. In that case, the addition of layers in the bilayer, tilayer graphene generally determines a reduction in uh, 
in the conduct in the conductance of the of the system. Uh, but I will move now to the other material of the talk, which is amorphous boron nitride, which I've been able to explore quite in detail uh, in, in a few years ago in a very intense collaboration with Samsung, uh, the University of Cambridge. Um, and that has led to the publication of very nice work in which the dielectric properties of the material have been uh, have been presented. Amorphous boronitride is a very nice material for its dielectric properties. Its its dielectric constant is that it's quite uh, low, uh, as the title of the paper basically basically says, and this makes it a very appealing material for um, future electronic circuits. In particular. Uh, this is the solution of a very long-standing problem in which, in order to reduce the size of the integrated circuits, one looks for very good dielectrics with a very low dielectric constant, but thermally and mechanically stable, which could be used to separate the metallic vias in integrated circuits. Uh, many materials, different materials have been proposed uh, during the years, but many of them have, are, were not terribly stable. They tried to uh, decrease the dielectric constant by exploding air, so making the material uh, porous, but this is definitely not the solution. Amorphous baron boronitride seems exactly to uh, be the right candidate, candidate for, this kind of, uh, for this kind of application. Uh, from our point of side, we are theoreticians and we like to use computers to explore, uh, to do material science and to explore these new materials. This has actually led us to develop here at ICN2 many different tools, ranging from machine learning to uh, um, ad hoc uh, classical molecular dynamics simulation. All of these in order to uh, tune, to understand how the tuning of the different uh, properties of such material could affect the, uh, its uh, properties for this kind of application. But amorphous boronitride, and in general boronitride, is not definitely useful only for electronics. Indeed, recently, uh, in a very uh, similar structure, in a metal insulator, metal structure, this material has been uh, shown to be able to uh, give um, a random number generator, a true random number generator. It's a system that can be used. It's a, it's a kind of application which is definitely close to neuromorphic computing, but still uh, can be used, for example, for much wider for a range of applications like the internet of everything. My last slide exactly is exactly instead related to the use of boronitride, multi-layer HBN for neuromorphic, uh, neuromorphic computing. This has been proved uh, in, the, in 2020. Uh, by a group of Professor Maria Lanza at Kaust. In that case, what can be observed is that the presence of natural defects in the amorphous regions in boronitride uh, gave uh, possible logic to conducting channel to form whenever the uh, in interface was actually applied a voltage across um, the yeah, resistive so switching behavior. Okay. And then That's we need to wrap up. Uh, yeah, 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 that's definitely my last slide. So okay. yes, the, in this last slide, the, 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 the shows the application of uh, boronitride, multi-stack with defects for resistive switching and then for neuromorphic applications. Uh, thanks, uh, Clivia, it's, uh, it's, it's over. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Uh, it's actually fascinating how we are now going to the amorphous regime um, for neuromorphic computing. And what I would like to suggest is that the questions for Alejandro we take after the presentation of our next speaker. Alejandro, hang on then, right? Don't go away. <laughs> okay, that's perfect. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome um, Dr. Sayani Majumdar. Um, I'm a, my, so Yanni is with the technique with the microelectronics and quantum technologies uh, sector uh, at VTT, the National Technical Research Center of Finland, and she will give a talk uh, entitled "Neuromorphic Computing and Adaptive Sensing: A Device to System Level Perspective." But I will steal twenty seconds, if I may, just to say that. Um, so Yanni earned her PhD in 2006 from Yadavpur University in England, uh, has worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Obo Academy University, University of Turku, and also at Aalto University, where she uh, used a prestigious Academy of Finland Research Fellowship, 
She has been a visiting uh, scientist at MIT, the Francis Peter Magnet Laboratory, as well as at the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research. And what she's uh, interested in, I think we will hear it from herself next. Welcome, Sayani. Thank you very much, Clivia. Uh, can you all hear me and see my screen? Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, for the nice introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here and uh, giving the talk, but it would have been much more nicer if I could visit you in person, hopefully sometime soon. So I'm always excited about talking of these topics, uh, which is not um, something that we started very long time ago, but it's a very rapidly developing field and um, quite a lot of new um, applications are coming up from all sides. So getting more and more interesting every day. Uh, a little bit about myself, although Clivia already gave the introduction. So I am from uh, India, actually, from the city of Calcutta. I did my master's from the Presidency College, Calcutta, and did my PhD from Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science in Jadapur, which um, is uh, not only the oldest research institute in India, but all of Asia and Professor Siviraman actually got, uh, I mean, his Nobel Prize from this institute. So it's a quite prestigious place. Uh, I started my postdoctoral research fellowship at the University of Turku and Ombo Academy. And I, uh, as a visiting scientist, also visited many places. Um, like uh, in MIT, in um, um, Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research, and also worked quite some time with the synchrotron radiation facilities at Berlin. And I was in Alto University until 2019, and uh, starting from 2019, actually, I started working in VTT, which is the Technical Research Center of Finland. So VTT is uh, actually you can say in the middle of basic research and industry. So we are more on the application side. Our target is uh, to take the basic research to uh, any industrial technological solution, providing that. Uh, although I am mostly on the emerging technology side, so our idea is to develop the technologies um, more than uh, I mean, upscaling or piloting thing, which uh, which is also one key activity in BTT, but uh, I'm more on the technology side. So we develop uh, devices and systems that is upscalable. So eventually uh, in near future, we can upscale them for the technology processes. So that is the idea. And our uh, technology and R&D infrastructure actually ranges wide lot of uh, things. Uh, I mean, starting from biotechnology, food technology, forest industry, metrology, and everything. But we are uh, in Micronova mostly focused on micro and nanoelectronic technologies. And we are close region to Helsinki. And we have a very huge clean room facility, which is the largest in the Nordic countries. And it holds quite a lot of key technologies um, that VTT provides. So silicon photonics, uh, active other silicon devices, MEMS and uh, thin film RF components, uh, tunnel junction devices, uh, 2D material and device integration. and very recently, actually, uh, VTT built its first quantum computer. So five qubit quantum computer has been built uh, end of last year. And we have been working also on superconducting qubit technologies and cryo CMOS and SFQ and quantum communication technologies. And one of the neuromorphic technology application we are also um, planning to apply to the quantum technologies uh, where autonomous quantum error correction could be one possible solution. But uh, these are all very um, futuristic and fascinating plans. Uh, so far, uh, I mean, we have a wide range of experimental work facilities for device fabrication and integration. 
and that includes a wide lot of uh, nanofab uh, processes uh, concerning different lithography and etching and thin film deposition and uh, wafer bonding and different structural electrical characterization, uh, different integration technologies and everything. Um, most of the fab facilities uh, have been kind of upgraded for 300 millimeter processes already. Some of them are ongoing and very soon, most probably they are going to be upgraded as well. But uh, now I can come to mostly my topic, uh, like the neuromorphic computing and adaptive sensing. So I will start uh, with basically the challenges. Aleyandro, what uh, was giving very nice introduction already. So I guess my job is kind of simplified in that case. And then uh, the in-memory computing, what are the requirements for the memory components for uh, doing efficient in-memory computing? And uh, the novel memory state of the art at this point and why in-sensor computing makes sense. And my, um, I mean, major topic of research uh, are the ferroelectric tunnel junction and ferroelectric field effect transistors. So I will go into a bit more detail on that side. And eventually I'll be finishing uh, giving you a device to systems level uh, benchmarking. Uh, I mean, how we do that. And uh, it's a platform that we have been developing to um, shorten basically the uh, hardware development process because hardware development is the most expensive and time consuming uh, part of everything. So how we can um, quickly do this thing. So basically starting from the limitation of the von Neumann architecture, it's, uh, I mean, it's a huge amount of discussion nowadays. So it's known to most of you that uh, the physically separated processor and memory is basically uh, getting to be the bottleneck, especially in the era of AI, where huge amount of data needs to get transferred from uh, memory and processor. And most of the time, the processor just sits idle doing nothing because it waits for the data to be transferred from the memory. So that causes a huge amount of energy loss, which has um, high carbon footprint and then time loss for computing. So some of the uh, computing tasks which are really computationally demanding, especially AI training, uh, let's say one deep neural network training and the equivalent amount of energy and I mean, number of uh, sensor connected to internet of things, it's becoming actually completely unsustainable that each um, device uh, doing all those uh, artificial intelligence tasks based on 24 seven sensory data input. So it needs to change. And uh, one of the solution uh, that has been um, given is this on-chip computing and mimicking biological brain and going for more like spike-based computing, the thing that um, human brain on all biological brain actually does. So the idea is to get uh, the idea from biology, how we do computing with, I mean, not so precise way, but in an efficient way. I mean, that's the major thing and how we can leverage uh, the device physics, the material physics to uh, mimic the biological synaptic and neuron functionalities. And the idea would be to build a system that can learn from examples. So you don't have to train it all the time. It, it will uh, learn from its uh, previous tasks and perform tasks accordingly. Also, it will be able to process large scale and unstructured data within limited resources, because in many cases, IoT devices need to work within very limited uh, power supply. And during uh, those limited power 
conditions it need to still operate and do those computational tasks and adaptation is one of the things so that it adjusts its behavior to new inputs it can make uh, certain decisions and do some time series prediction task classification and correction tasks and things like that and all doing this with the power efficiency of the human brain which is uh, basically femtojoule per synaptic activity range so coming to the in memory computing um, tasks how it is done mostly in a crossbar architecture and the crossbar architecture actually does the vector matrix multiplication task and each cross point of the crossbar is actually a memory state device. Alejandro was giving a very nice introduction to those memory state uh, device elements. It can be from different uh, material, uh, different uh, physical phenomena, uh, but still the idea is it has a conductance state that it remembers. And based on that conductance states, basically, the computation is done so the multiplication is done using ohm's law and the addition is done using uh, Kirchhoff's current law so the voltage inputs uh, to the memory stir uh, is converted into current output of the memory stir based on the two principles and then the peripheral circuits uh, like analog to digital conversion digital to analog conversion summing amplification comparator and all those uh, digital interface actually converts those data and feeds to the other circuit so basically the analog part uh, analog accelerator um, you can say is done within these memory stiff circuits so the advantages of using the memory stiff circuit is um, the analog resistive switching property of the memory stir is used for this um, vector matrix multiplication this is a, a highly parallel operation so very fast and very energy efficient but from the real circuit perspective there are challenges that still need to be addressed and researched so irreproducibility of the intermediate states being one um, in many devices and especially the filamentary devices maintaining those intermediate states is often um, not non-trivial i mean it's very complicated and it has a memory uh, i mean mind of its own it can do stuff which you don't want it to do <laughs> but it's uh, it's often the case and then leakage current and crosstalk between um, adjacent uh, memory components which can totally corrupt and give uh, unwanted values for your computing circuits so that is one thing then large array implementation uh, also involves uh, the parasitics from the circuit and everything which which is still not solved so these are all open questions and challenges to the community that needs to be addressed so if we look at the current memory landscape uh, all of the above ones you can say they are the standard cmos memories so sram dram and uh, capacitor based and floating gate based memories and the lower panel um, gives you uh, basically the idea of the emerging memory technologies that people have been working with so basically the spin based uh, magnet um, magnet magnetic tunnel junction or stt ram kind of memories and then phase change memories um, oxide r rams or uh, conducting bridge RMs. Many of these uh, actually emerging memories, even uh, the phase change memories and the oxide RMs, they are already coming to market. They already reached the uh, fab facilities. So kind of becoming commercial products very soon, but still they have their issues that uh, still need to be addressed and for us uh, we are mostly working on uh, ferroelectric uh, devices one of the reason for choosing the ferroelectric devices being 
they are voltage driven devices, not the current driven devices. That's why they have very low power advantage, one of the thing. Then they are forming free because you don't uh, form any filament in these devices. The reproducibility is quite good. But uh, then the current level actually in ferroelectric devices are often pretty low and the read noise can be significant in many cases. So those are issues, um, of course, that needs um, addressing. In this case, I have shown you this uh, three different architecture. One is uh, the ferroelectric RAM, which is already a commercial technology. You can have, uh, buy these products even from the market. So it's pretty standard uh, where you have one transistor and one capacitor structure. And the charge is basically stored uh, as the polarization state of the ferroelectric of the capacitor. The biggest problem in this case is the capacitor area is often quite big and that gives you a large footprint of the device. So very dense integration is um, a challenge. But the other two technologies like ferroelectric field effect transistor and ferroelectric tunnel junctions, they are still new kid in the block. So they still need more research and um, all the upscaling uh, possibilities and uh, scalability wise and um, current wise, everything needs to be um, checked more carefully in these devices. So if we look at the current memory landscape and do a quick comparison between the CMOS memories and the emerging memory stiff memories, we see that, I mean, lot of criteria needs to be addressed when we say, okay, these memories are good for a technology. I mean, let's say not only from non-volatile memory technology perspective, but also if they are suitable for deep neural network training or inference or spiking neural network applications. And Although this is a very exhaustive list, I, I can say in a brief way that, okay, none of the technologies basically can tick all the boxes. So no one solution there. And it has to be application specific solution for anything. So what we need, we have to first know and decide. And based on that, what material physics, what device physics, what um, uh, circuit or system level design would fit that need that needs to be um, decided at that point. So as a pictorial way, this is uh, one of the things described very nicely in this paper. It's quite old now, but uh, at least none of these things changed. So of course, these are the major important um, parameters that need to be addressed and none of them really uh, gets close to, uh, I mean, tick all the boxes. But another thing additionally, what we have to care about is scalability of a certain technology, like some of the lithium ion transistors and other devices kind of in a single device level, they have shown very nice performance, but whether you can upscale those processes for really uh, technical um, applications, that's something that needs uh, to be addressed. Also CMOS compatibility is another issue because CMOS is a developed platform which uh, still will be used for several years still. So anything that can um, use basically the robustness and versatility of the CMOS um, components are the most needed components. So everything depends on all these things and fault tolerance, um, noise sensitivity, compatibility with other uh, components on the chip, uh, what temperature window it can operate on, all these things matter. And while thinking about in-sensor computing needs, something that I have been also talking about, like 
all the internet connected devices are sending data to cloud all the time. And some of those data are really redundant and they are not needed so much. Like for an example, uh, a surveillance camera, like it, it is sending data all the time to cloud without anything happening or a patient monitoring system, for example. If it's, um, I mean, if there is any critical event that needs uh, immediate attention, then it should send data for further processing. That makes sense. So the idea for in-sensor computing is the sensors itself will have intelligence so that it can decide when a critical decision point is reached and it will only send data or communicate with um, other communicating devices or yeah, healthcare providers or whoever is taking decision only when a critical threshold is reached. So that is uh, basically the idea for in-sensor computing and it can be done using uh, the spiking neural networks where above a certain uh, critical threshold, only the neuron will be uh, firing and that will do the, I mean, computation in the spiking network. So coming to uh, the details of the physics of the ferroelectric tunnel junction, as uh, I was also showing you before, it's basically an ultra thin ferroelectric layer sandwiched between two dissimilar metal electrodes giving you an asymmetric uh, potential profile basically. And depending on the applied electric field on the device, you either switch the polarization of the ferroelectric up or down. And based on that, you have either charge accumulation or depletion uh, at the ferroelectric metal interface. And this uh, accumulation or depletion basically leads to your device on off state. So the, both the electron, um, I mean, uh, work function of both met metals and then the uh, electron concentration of the metals and the ferroelectric polarization state, all these matter when we use them as a memory. So we want as high as possible the R on off ratio. We want them to be more um, stable. So retention time needs to be high. And to do that, the ferroelectric polarization needs to be stable. So we try to minimize the depolarizing field and that can be done using um, mostly the charge carrier uh, concentration in the two metal electrodes because those charges basically stabilize the ferroelectric polarization. And if there are less number of charges, the depolarizing field eventually becomes stronger and that uh, gives to memory relaxation. So these are basically the properties that are needed for especially the neuromorphic devices. That's why I give a more like introduction. In my work, I have actually worked with several different kind of um, ferroelectric. So starting from oxide perovskite, uh, like barium titanate, uh, PZT, all those uh, kind of uh, ferroelectric devices, which are the traditional ones. But nowadays, uh, yeah, because they are not CMOS compatible, we are moving more towards, let's say, hafnium zirconium oxide based or ALD um, compatible materials. But uh, these materials also were, had very nice properties. So you get almost several orders of magnitude R on off ratio. Uh, they work over wide range of temperature and high retention, uh, fast switching property and everything. And uh, in this materials, what we saw that even if you have two similar metals at two electrodes, uh, basically the interfaces are not the same. So when you grow the ferroelectric on top of a bottom electrode and when the other way around, the interface effects actually make it an asymmetric um, 
tunnel junction. And that gives rise to very large um, on-off ratio and all other ferroelectric tunnel junction properties that we look for. And also I worked quite a lot with polymer uh, ferroelectric memories. The best thing about polymer ferroelectric memories are it's very low temperature processable. So basically 140 degrees Celsius is the annealing temperature for the poly polymer ferroelectric to reach its beta phase uh, compared to the oxide ferroelectric, which needs 600, 700 degrees temperature, which is not CMOS post-processable. And there are different, uh, I mean, lead or other components, which are not also encouraged uh, nowadays, of course. So a lot of material restrictions are coming up. And in that sense, polymer ferroelectrics are very robust. I mean, the molecules um, are, I mean, even at single molecular level, it was shown it has a very nice uh, polarization. And what we observed is if we change one metallic electrode in this tunnel junctions with a semiconducting electrode, you actually not only change the tunnel barrier height when you switch the polarization, but at the same time, you change the tunnel barrier width as well, because when the polarization is away from the semiconductor, you form a short key barrier at the interface, which eventually adds up to the tunnel barrier width. And that gives rise to a larger on-off ratio compared to when you have two metal electrodes. So one semiconductor electrode basically improves the on-off ratio quite a bit, but then uh, it can be questioned like, if we have a semiconductor electrode, can our um, retention time suffer because the charge carrier concentration is much lower compared to a metal. But at least for this 1% niobium doped um, strontium titanate that we used, the material was very stable. The device had very long retention time. So there was not too much problem with that. And the best thing is uh, getting the analog uh, properties. So depending on the voltage sweep range, you can actually not only do only on off, but pretty stable intermediate resistance states, which makes them very attractive as uh, analog um, memory components. Then I can quickly tell you that, okay, there are different properties like long term and short term potentiation and depression based on uh, amplitude and uh, frequency and delay between the pulses. And these time constants are actually very important when you are training a network for different tasks. So these are uh, parameters that need to be um, known when you are basically training a parameter. And for spiking network, the spike timing dependent plasticity of the synapses is one of the key criteria. So it's important to know like um, a synapse when it gets two uh, incoming pulses from the pre-neuron and the post-neuron, depending on the time difference between those, it actually learns. So it's uh, synaptic weight changes based on the delta T. So um, that's a very important parameter for uh, the synapses, so at different time scales. So at which time scale, basically, you can train your synapse for the spiking network and it can um, do the classification tasks or any task. Um, we need to know that. And a symmetric uh, change uh, is very important. That's why the real pulse parameters are very important as well. So how can you control those pulse parameters so that uh, here we studied mostly like the biologically plausible um, different uh, pulses, but you can design different pulses that's possible. I mean, different um, time of spiking. So because in spiking networks, information is encoded in terms of uh, spike timing. So that's an important thing to know, like how you can train your spiking network based on the spiking timing dependent plasticity. And most of these junctions were really fast uh, switching. 
so down to 20 nanosecond pulse width it can switch uh, very efficiently and do all those long term and short term potentiation and depression and spike timing plasticity kind of function and the only thing is the switching voltage changes of course when you apply 20 nanosecond pulses the uh, potentiation and depression uh, pulses magnitude increases and that gives uh, some uh, designing problem like what is really your uh, technology wise suitable so in cmos processes like if you are using 180 nanometer processes or something you have certain limitations of uh, voltage that you can apply and if that voltage within a short time can really switch your devices so these become additional point of concern and you need to do that another uh, interesting thing was we actually could do a transition from synaptic to neuronal functionality just by changing the doping concentration of the semiconductor that that i was mentioning so if you have higher doping concentration you have lower depolarizing field in the material and then you have pretty steady data retention but when you decrease the doping concentration you have lesser and lesser number of uh, charge carriers that could um, screen the polarization charges and that's why the depolarizing field becomes significant and that can give rise to uh, quickly firing uh, neuron kind of um, property in the devices so with whether you are using higher concentration or lower concentration of electrons, you can have basically from the same process parameters, you can get synapses and neurons in the same device. And that from these uh, least amount of uh, doping concentration, we saw this neural and fi firing functionality when using let's say um, sub threshold pulses if you use a higher than threshold voltage pulse of course it will switch all the time but if you use um, lower uh, voltage pulses which is uh, in the sub threshold region you will see there are i mean this integration functionality happening like it will integrate for uh, several seconds and then it will start the firing process and that integration time and everything you can handle you can control with the pulse uh, frequency duration and uh, pulse magnitude and everything so there are i mean in general uh, with memory stir whenever neuron circuits are shown there are additional rc components which makes the circuit uh, footprint quite big but in this case because we are just using the semiconductor capacitance to modulate uh, the functionality so therefore it's a single memory state device that can work as a neuron and that is one good thing in this case and the other thing was morphology control so whether um, you i mean change the annealing temperature for the ferroelectric it can give you let's say different functionalities uh, in terms of switching voltage and switching speed so in some devices where low temperature annealing was done the on off ratio really decreased when we had uh, 20 nanosecond pulses but in other cases uh, where you have a uh, higher temperature annealing like 145 or something then we saw even down to 20 nanosecond pulses the on off ratio remain unchanged but actually for the lower temperature operating pulses what we saw is the uh, linearity in current voltage update is um, actually more controllable and that is basically due to more gradual change in domain switching because of uh, most probably some domain pinning sites uh, which uh, which is required for those uh, analog 
memories. And that is uh, something what we are uh, kind of uh, trying to uh, investigate in more details now, if we can really controllably uh, operate in those analog states when we are dealing with those 20 nanosecond pulses. Also, uh, the fitting of the experimental data uh, with different domain switching model basically is important uh, in a sense that from these data, we can characterize what uh, voltage pulse requirement like in terms of magnitude and duration would be needed to achieve a certain um, memory state basically. And we saw that in all these materials, mostly the nucleation limited switching model uh, is the best one that fits. And there is a certain distribution of main switching time. So it, it varies quite a lot based on the material properties as well. And from these values, you can uh, calculate the uh, pulse duration, the region, the S value here is the switched domain. So one is fully switched or zero is um, non-switched. And based on the pulse duration and magnitude, how you can control those uh, mixed domain phase. And that is uh, one very important parameter for any analog memory to stabilize. Uh, this is actually um, something which is still undergoing work, uh, but this is with 2D semiconductor based ferroelectric FETs that we have been working on uh, with MOS2 as the channel semiconductor and ferroelectric um, layers, uh, polarization uh, dependent MOS2 on and off state basically can give rise to a large on off ratio. And in only ferroelectric uh, gate case, we saw that it's very hard to control the analog state. It's basically a binary memory. But uh, when we uh, removed the uh, ferroelectric uh, and put a composite layer of a ferroelectric and a dielectric instead, it's much um, more controllable analog state. That is um, something that we can get. And that is one, a uh, very important uh, phenomenon to study and have more things. Another uh, thing which we are studying in terms of um, cryogenic memories are the oxide, uh, of different oxide tunnel junctions. They have pretty stable intermediate resistance state at low temperature and large on-off ratio. Also the long-term potentiation and depression, um, all those memory properties very nicely can be seen in oxide tunnel junctions. And um, the near sensor um, computing, uh, that is something we already did, where actually an electronic skin with uh, pressure sensors um, made of MZIN and PDMS kind of sensor was used to um, I mean, um, that was uh, getting the si signal from the touch. So how much pressure you were applying and that information uh, gets transferred to the circuit where uh, analog to digital conversion and using a ring oscillator and H detector, uh, those signals are converted uh, as optical signals and then an optical, electro-optically switching memristor uh, basically uh, can do the memory and um, training task. And it is uh, something that we shown that using those uh, pressure application on the sensor, you can make the system learn different things um, like from the touch sensing, uh, it can learn to uh, recognize the Braille uh, words and uh, also Morse codes and all those things. So that is something we have done uh, previously, but here we actually cannot say it's an in-sensor computing. It's 
kind of a near sensor computing and then still some peripheral circuitry and everything is needed to actually perform those tasks. But in these ongoing projects, one is missile uh, from the Horizon Europe. We are actually uh, going more for 3D integrated systems where uh, the quantum dot and graphene based photo detectors uh, will be monolithically fabricated on top of uh, the CMOS circuit and that will act as the cellular sensor processor. Then there will be a cerebellar processor which will integrate the non-volatile memories uh, with the CMOS um, structures and that will provide information about spatiotemporal awareness of the system, like when a bird is flying, it's varying uh, both in space and time. So uh, all those information uh, will be processed based on the photo detection from the quantum dot and graphene based photo detector and the ferroelectric based uh, this cerebellar processor memory. And then finally, the most uh, complicated system will be the cortex processor, which will do the higher level analysis and uh, spatiotemporal classification and prediction and kind of situational awareness kind of uh, decision making. Another uh, project uh, also ongoing on this is the NSF and Academy of Finland funded project where uh, we are uh, doing most like flexible uh, sensing and wearable kind of uh, devices where not only near sensor computing, but we will do also in sensors. So the single device uh, basically will be able to sense uh, something and keep the information in its uh, memory itself. And that memory will be used for the artificial neural network to process. And uh, the very recent thing that uh, I have been involved in is basically material to system level benchmarking uh, platform development. So here, uh, the idea is when we are starting with any new material, any new device, the idea is to uh, check uh, the entire value chain if it makes sense to go with these devices uh, because hardware implementation is always um, time consuming and expensive. So the idea is we do some proof of concept experiments. We fa fabricate the devices, do some um, characterization, pulsed characterization. And from the fitting of those data, we take out the parameters and try the architecture and algorithmic um, level simulation that okay if any of these materials or systems are basically uh, promising for um, future upscaling and everything. So if we look like this, it the workflow looks like this. So we fabricate device, we do some pulsed measurements, we take out the parameters from those measurements like how quickly these devices can learn. So what would be the uh, energy consumption, how many cycles of training would be needed, how much right noise and non-linearity and all these, um, I mean, device non-idealities could affect. And then changing some parameters in the circuit level and the systems level, you can see that, okay, with certain kind of device, what is the maximum efficiency you can get? And if that gives any, uh, I mean, promising approach for that kind of device, I mean, if any, uh, let's say for the ferroelectric devices, I can show you some uh, recent data, like for the large MNIST uh, handwritten digit classification, it could do something like 93% was the highest accuracy based on those numbers. If I uh, do some benchmarking with uh, the numerical data that is possible, that is 98% accuracy. So it's kind of 5% away from that. But if I say like tantalum oxide based memristor, which is one of the standard memristor, 
then it's far better compared to that. So uh, basically the control over analog states are quite good in these materials, but still it's, um, let's say 5% away from the ideal numerical value. If I use it for a small uh, uh, digit recognition, then it's almost close to the numerical value. So depending on different factors, I mean, size of the network and conductance range, and I mean, different parameters, of course, your values will change, but it's much quicker to check whether these devices, uh, what, e what is the best uh, result you can get out of those. Also for, um, okay, can I, for the spatiotemporal uh, varying data set, let's say like this number four that I showed you where you have uh, not only the spatial change, but also the temporal change. We can uh, do this uh, simulation for the uh, spiking neural network training. And it's possible to see like uh, depending on different uh, neuronal parameters or uh, synaptic, postsynaptic current uh, parameters, how the uh, training would work. So this is uh, something what um, what is mostly being done currently. So I come finally to the conclusion that different uh, innovative material and device uh, design is very important, very crucial for ultra low power intelligent devices. And the materials to systems level benchmarking tool is um, uh, something that we are working on for significantly improving the hardware development time frame. And integration of sensing and memory platforms is really opening up a vast era of smart and real-time operating systems. And the, I mean, application could be anything that you can almost think of like robotics and autonomous vehicles and healthcare, security and surveillance space. And actually things that I was telling you like quantum error correction and many other sectors where we have been uh, trying to apply uh, these uh, autonomous, um, I mean, decision-making and smart components. Okay, so I guess I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Yanni, for this amazing tour de force uh, that you have walked us through the uh, developments, uh, alternatives, uh, question marks, the challenges, um, and also have you have shared with us this this uh, very interesting uh, from materials to uh, system benchmarking. Exactly. So, I mean, we are always interested in working with new materials, and I guess materials is one of the key thing that that can bring. I mean, different functionalities and everything we we should not get stuck to only set of materials that no. that are there but yeah i mean because the hardware development time frame is pretty long so it's important that we know that okay these materials have good properties um so you know, there is a question in the chat uh, mm -hmm. uh, from uh stefan Roche. Uh, Stefan, if you are still here, maybe you want to ask it yourself. Okay, he, Stefan might have gone for a coffee. So first of all, thank you for the great talk. Can we estimate uh, the energy costs? Uh, the energy costs, oh, wait, wait a minute, I move, I move the question, hi. Yeah, can we estimate the energy cost for a simple resistive switching event uh, using, for example, the ferroelectricity based technology? Yes, it it's is possible. Mm -hmm. And then, how would it compare to the equivalent bio event energy waste in terms of energy dissipation? What could explain, for example, the large differences between uh, these events and the bio events? Um, I mean, 
single device wise, we get some numbers, of course, but when it goes to the system, then it, it is several uh, things actually that can eat up quite a lot of things. Then, I mean, most of the articles and everything you will find, they are mostly talking about only a single device uh, measurement, but when it goes to the system level um, energy estimation, then it's uh, much higher compared to what we see normally because uh, there are leakage issues, there are delays and everything incorporated in the circuit. So, I mean, ferroelectric technology, let's say, is promising in a way that it, it is extremely low current device because it's an uh, electric field driven, driven device. So in that sense, when you uh, do those uh, uh, power conversion like IVT, your I is basically very low. And then if your T that is switching time is in nanosecond time scale, you, you are in a good range, of course. But then it's, I mean, also the uh, memory window and on-off ratio and everything, if you are getting those uh, ideal uh, parameters that you want from your memory, within those um, IV ranges, that is also something which is crucial to know and understand. Okay. Okay, and so. in our case, let's say, because we are always uh, thinking about the CMOS driving circuit limitations. Um, so if it's 180 nanometer technology, then your maximum driving voltage could be something. And if it's even lower um, size, I mean, of course, smaller transistors cannot provide you with that high driving voltage. So then all your needs will change automatically. So it's, it's complicated. <laughs> so so there went one, one uh, a second question from Stefan, which actually I echo very much is, um, so, if you can estimate this at, at the device level, how much of this efficiency, switching efficiency that you gain comes from interfaces of the materials as opposed to the bulk material? Is there, is there a picture that you can go as thin as possible or and, and not lose efficiency? I mean, definitely interface plays a big role. <laughs> And I mean, ferroelectric devices are mostly interface driven because there are no forming uh, happening in this, uh, because in f uh, mostly oxide RMs or conducting bridge RMs, you, you can do even, I mean, device scaling pretty easily because single filaments are, I mean, less than nanometer in size or something actually the scale devices work very well uh, because of that, because you are physically constraining the filaments at certain places and that improves the switching reproducibility. But in ferroelectric cases, when we even scale down, the problem is you are uh, going from a multi-domain phase to more or less mm -hmm. monodomain or a few domain phase. And then it's very difficult to control the intermediate states and yeah. you can just go anywhere. I mean, very much stochastic switching of those <laughs> uh, single domains happen. So it's not very straightforward to do uh, those kind of things. And uh, yeah, I mean, different technologies has its limitation. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, some limitations are physics-based limitations, which are hard to change but some limitations are more like engineering side. So how you can improve your interface, how you can do, let's say some innovative uh, planning and device designing so that you can overcome those challenges. So those are the things. Okay. Still plenty of things to do for, for all of us, I take it. Um, are there any questions that you would like to ask right now before we, we have the option to move to uh, an, 
what is it, a Zoom, uh, a Teams meeting, right? A Teams uh, room to continue the discussion with those who would like to. Any other questions immediately right now? Okay, uh, any questions from Alejandro or for Alejandro? Then uh, it remains for me to those who may not have the opportunity to join further discussion to say thank you very much for, to all the participants and especially to Sayani and to Alejandro. Um, it's, it's been a, a big dive into the big waters of neuromorphic computing. And um, uh, there's one question in the chat. Uh, okay, is, is it possible that Bly Casals asked directly? Okay, well, I'll read it out. Uh, Bly Casals asked, um, well, first of all, he thank you for the nice talk. And the question is, is there any opportunity for the stochastic processes um, and learning or in learning, I guess? Actually, I mean, for deep neural networks, it's, I mean, it's still possible. Of course, you if you have um, uh, more random and stochastic switching, it's still possible to do certain um, computational task with them. But I guess it's, I mean, random noise actually can be better handled in spiking networks because biology doesn't care so much about precision. It's a lot of noise actually can be handled in the spiking network. So more than deep neural network, which is actually a more computationally stable platform because this has been done in during many years. So it's more standard algorithm that people use, but spiking networks are yeah now heavily researched and hopefully something will come out very soon where the spiking networks or I mean different other options like probabilistic computing and mm -hmm. um, let's say reservoir computing many different um, new algorithms are coming up which will be able to better handle those stochastic uh, switching devices and noise in some cases actually it has been shown uh, injection of noise is actually better uh, compared to non noisy situations. So, Aha. a little bit of randomness goes a long way. <laughs> some, some randomness. And I mean, of course, it is also used uh, for those random number generation and yes. hardware security. I mean, even sensor level encryption for data, all those things. So, it's. Okay. I mean, sometimes we think random <laughs> noise and devices are, are non-idealities are something it's very hard to control. But of course there are, I mean, when it's a large network of devices, then th there are options of doing something meaningful with them as well. Super. Thank you very much. I, I invite everybody to join us in, in the Teams. There is a link in, in the chat. And, and I'm sure that uh, we can continue for a few more minutes there. There are plenty of questions, lots of interest connections to not only information processing, but uh, to all what is our digital and to some degree analog world by now. So goodbye to the people who are on uh, in this meeting. Uh, we close it and we go to the chat, okay? Great, to the thank team. you. Thank you.